Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. So as I have promised you earlier, we are getting started with CFA level 1 prep revision series and in this series we will begin with the subject fixed income and within fixed income we are at the topic cash flow structures and instrument types. So depending upon the cash flow structures of a fixed income instrument the instrument types can be categorized and this will be the first session on this topic. Now when we begin with this the first thing that comes into our mind is two important categories of bonds that is the amortizing bonds versus bullet bonds. Now what happens in case of a bullet bond the borrower has borrowed the principal amount and the borrower is going to repay the principal amount only after the completion of maturity period. For example, if the maturity period is 10 years, then the borrower has borrowed today the principal amount and the principal amount will be repaid after 10 years on maturity and annually coupon payments will be made by the borrower to the investor. That is what we call as a bullet structure of a bond. On the other side, the amortizing structure is little different. In case of amortizing structure, the borrower will pay the annual interest anyway, but the principal amount or the par value of the loan will be amortized over the life. So if the life of the loan or if the life of the bond is 10 years, then the entire amount of the principal will be amortized over the 10 years period. As a result, the investor gets back the principal recovery on yearly basis over the life of the bond. So what happens depending upon these cash flow structures when these two types of bonds exist, there will be a discussion about two types of risks that is the credit risk and the reinvestment risk. So fundamentally an investor will always be having these two types of risk. Now what is credit risk? See the investor will always have a suspicion on the credit of the borrower. So maybe if the credit rating deteriorates after the bond investment has been made, then the investor is at a risk of default. That default risk is there and to prevent the default risk, what is better? If the principal is getting amortized on yearly basis over the life of the bond, a substantial portion of the principal is recovered by a given point of time and a little bit of principal is still left over. In other words, the credit risk will be lower in case of amortizing bond, but credit risk will be higher in case of the bullet bond because entire principal has to be repaid on maturity itself. Now, what happens when there is a different category of risk that is observed? And that risk is reinvestment risk. Now that happens not with the bullet bond but with amortizing bond. Now what is this reinvestment risk? Every time the bond is offering some cash flow to the investor, the investor has now a need to reinvest these cash flows. Now somebody could have taken this reinvestment as an opportunity as well. But what if the market interest rates are little declining? Then you will have to reinvest your money at a lower and lower rates. Every time you get the cash flow, you have to reinvest at a lower rate. So reinvestment risk will be very high when it is amortizing bond and credit risk will be high when it is a bullet bond. What if there is something in between an amortizing bond and a bullet bond? We can identify this as a balloon payment structure or which could be a partially amortizing debt. So a partially amortizing debt or a balloon payment structure comes with a straight simple notion that it will have feature of both of these that is it will have feature of bullet bond as well as amortizing bond. Now what happens in case of balloon payment a portion of the principal is to be paid only upon maturity just like a bullet payment but we cannot call it a bullet payment because only a portion of the principal will be paid on maturity whereas the remaining portion will be amortized over the life. So for example, say if $1000 is the value of the bond that is par value of the bond, then suppose $400 is reserved to be paid on maturity, 
then the remaining $600 can be paid over the life of the bond, say $60 every year along with the coupon payment of that particular year. In this way, when the cash flow is structured, it is not a bullet bond, it is not a completely amortizing bond, it is a partially amortizing bond and at the end the payment that is made is referred to as a balloon payment. So a balloon payment structure is actually nothing but resembling the amortizing bond which is a partially amortizing bond. So what I'll do is I'll provide you some very very important notes over here on the screen and you will not be having enough time to note down the whole thing. So either you can pause the video and take note of all the notes what you require or you can take the screenshots and uh, deal with them later. So let me take you to those important notes now. So under the heading concept number one that is amortizing bonds versus bullet bonds you may write amortizing bonds offer higher cash flows in the early periods which impacts both credit risk and reinvestment risk for investors. In contrast bullet bonds repay the entire principal at maturity resulting in lower cash flows in the near term. Amortizing bonds return a portion of the principal along with each interest payment the borrower's liability reduces over time which lowers the credit risk for investors. However, this also exposes investors to reinvestment risk because they must reinvest the earlier cash inflows at prevailing market interest rates. Now moving ahead we would further write this reinvestment risk is more significant in fully amortizing bonds compared to partially amortizing bonds. So now we can conclude that for fully amortizing bonds there will be lower credit risk and higher reinvestment risk. In case of bullet bonds it will be the reversal scenario there will be higher credit risk and lower reinvestment risk and in case of partially amortizing bonds there will be moderate credit risk and moderate reinvestment risk and the concluding line can be written over here as the structure of bond repayment affects both the timing of cash flows and the risks to be borne by investors. Alright now moving ahead and now we take up the next discussion that is about balloon payment. Now I have already explained to you that balloon payment on its own is nothing different but it is basically the partially amortizing structure. So as I explained to you earlier when we were discussing the bullet bonds versus amortizing bonds we have already discussed the partially amortizing bond and I also mentioned that the payment made at the end over here is generally referred to as balloon payment. So if we quickly go through these important notes over here concept number two you may write let me expand the screen size for you. So concept number two with the title as balloon payment a balloon payment is the large final principal amount that is paid at maturity in a partially amortizing bond due to this structure periodic payments are lower compared to fully amortizing bonds because a portion of principal is deferred. However, the borrower must be prepared to repay a large amount at maturity which can pose refinancing or liquidity challenges. Investors face moderate credit and reinvestment risk as some principal is paid during the bond term and some at the end. Alright now let us move on to the next heading that we have to discuss as another important matter that is sinking fund provision. Now the name sinking fund I am sure it is generally fit into your mind sinking fund basically you are setting aside some cash flow some reserves so that it can be utilized for bearing some major payments ahead. So in case of a bond issue when the bond repayment has to be arranged through a sinking fund, sinking fund provision requires a substantial portion of your cash flows that will be generated out of profits should be set aside for arranging for repayment of the bond. Now what can be done? You can create the entire fund which would match with the future cash outflows and these uh, cash flows can be set aside and itself be invested. Now you may utilize these cash flows other way to start repayment of the bond. Now this is something very very important. See one side what happens when you are talking about sinking fund provision someone may find it illogical. Let me explain to you why. See you have issued bonds say having a coupon rate of 
and on the other side when you have some surplus cash you are putting it aside and trying to invest those cash flows so that your sinking fund can be created now when you are investing these cash flows you are not going to get the interest rate as much as the interest that you are paying on your bonds correct so instead of utilizing this sinking fund amount by investing in some other investments or some other kind of deposits it is better to start utilizing this money to repay the bonds and therefore there is a possibility that a portion of sinking fund is utilized to repay the bond before even its maturity so repayment of bond before maturity actually starts happening when there is a sinking fund maintained along with this so let us write up some quick important notes over here and uh, we will say under the concept heading 3 sinking fund provision a sinking fund provision is a feature included in some bonds that requires the issuer to regularly set aside funds for the repayment of the bond at maturity or for repurchasing a portion of the bond before maturity in some cases a sinking fund requires the issuer to redeem a portion of the bond issue periodically before maturity the specific bonds to be redeemed are not pre identified introducing uncertainty for investors this mechanism reduces credit risk over time by gradually repaying debt all right now let us move ahead and take up the next point for discussion that is floating rate notes now this is something very very simple while you have prepared the topic you have learned very well floating rate notes the coupon rate is not going to be a static rate it is going to change every time in other words it will be a fluctuating rate or a floating rate which is attached with some floating rate base like libor that is london interbank offer rate or it could be even mrr that is market reference rate that will be the base and there will be some spread added to that the spread is always constant and the base keeps on fluctuating overall coupon rate goes on fluctuating and that is why it is identified as a floating rate note so let us quickly write some important notes about floating rate notes and uh, we would write under concept number 4 frns that is floating rate notes have variable interest payments tied to a reference rate for example libor plus a spread while their coupons are unknown in advance they still have a fixed maturity date this makes them less sensitive to interest rate movements but unpredictable in cash flow planning all right now let us move on to the next discussion and that will be step up coupon bonds again as the name suggests step up means here on a predetermined basis again here the coupon rate is not going to be static rate it is going to change but here we cannot call it a floating rate because floating rate is a variable rate which fluctuates depending upon the market interest rate or market reference rate or any base that you would have picked up like libor in case of step up coupon bonds the coupon rates are not going to be static these will change but these are changing at a predefined notion that means you are going to have increased coupon rates at later stages and lower coupon rates at early stages this is basically giving a relaxation to the issuer of the bond because issuer doesn't have to take the burden of heavy interest payments right from the beginning maybe initial few years it will be very low rate then a little moderate rate and then compensating the investors by paying a higher rate at the later stage this is what we call as step up coupon bonds and let us write some important notes over here quickly in case of step up coupon bonds you may write under the concept number 5 a step up coupon bond is a bond with a preset schedule that increases the coupon rate at specified future dates now most important word over here is a preset schedule that makes it not a floating rate or a variable rate it makes it a step up coupon bond and that is defined to increase the coupon rate at specified future dates the step up structure compensates the investors for risks like interest rate increases or issuer's credit deterioration over time helps issuer's reduce initial interest costs and attracts investors by offering higher future income without needing to renegotiate the terms all right friends let us move on to the next point of our discussion and that is payment in kind bonds what we call as pik payment in kind bonds 
here you are not going to make the coupon payment in cash that means you are not going to give cash payments to the bond holder correct instead of that whatever amount of interest that is accruing you will simply add it to the principal that means more bond par value is emerging out of this in other words you are accumulating the interest and the lump sum value will be paid only upon the maturity so what happens the bond is issued at par coupon is computed at that par value in the first payment and then because the payment starts accumulating the every follow up coupon payment will be by application of the coupon rate on the cumulative principle not on the original principle this is the basic feature of this kind of uh, payment in kind bonds or pik bonds keep in mind one thing there will be only two cash flows that will happen one will be at the initial stage when the bond was issued and one will be at maturity when the bond is repaid or redeemed let me give you some important notes over here under the head concept number 6 that is payment in kind bonds you may write a payment in kind that is pik feature allows the issuer to defer interest payments by adding the unpaid interest to bonds principal instead of paying in cash no cash coupon is paid instead principal amount increases and future interest is calculated on this higher principal common in high yield or distressed debt where issuers face liquidity constraints offers higher yields to compensate for delayed cash flows exposes investors to greater risk as it signals issuers weak cash position 